Hi, I'm Dr. Richard Visser, and in this podcast, I will take you on a journey through the wilderness of scientific research and experiential knowledge. Together, we will clear a path to optimizing health, well-being, and longevity. I am a former Minister of Health and Sports with a PhD in Medical Sciences, a published researcher in the fields of obesity, lifestyle medicine, and longevity. I started my career path over three decades ago as a doctor of chiropractic. I'm excited to share my methods, know-how, and experience with you. So please join me on the Visser Podcast. Welcome to episode number eight of the Visser podcast. Hot and cold therapy, hyperbarics, and what does this all have to do with longevity? Well, I'm gonna start out with a quote. Hard times produce strong men. Strong men produce good times. Good times produce weak men. Repeat. This at the cellular level is what the current research is showing. So it's not only a good saying, but it's true at every level of life. And we talked about this before. We talked about this when I discussed with you, what was that? I think episode four on Pinot Noir red wine, why it's good for us, what does it have in it, and why Pinot Noir, because it's the wine that struggles the most, it's the grape that struggles the most, which gives you the sweetest juice afterwards, same here, so we're going to have to struggle a bit, adverse conditions in our bodies trigger the cells to go into survival and self-preservation mode, this is longevity. This is our body's genes triggering. We need to live. We need to repair our DNA. We need to get our epigenome optimized because we're in survival mode. So how do we do this? How do we do this when we're living the West? Talking mostly about the West, about developed countries. Um, there are countries that are in poverty, war, um, you know, and, and they have another deal. They have, you know, they are suffering, but I'm speaking mostly to us and to the viewers, which are most likely, um, have access to everything. And at the earliest signs of access, we become sedentary watch TV all day. We have food everywhere, especially junk food. Um, which if you look at the poor people that start going to obesity, it's because they, the junk food is cheaper. It's more accessible. Processed foods is cheaper. Um, everything else gets exported. All the good vegetables, fruits, um, the important stuff gets exported to the countries that pay the most money and the junk comes back to fill it. In areas where there's a lot of wealth, it's just overconsumption of everything. Just because we can, we're bored, we have nothing to do, and we're sitting still. Good times, weak men, women, whatever, fill it in. So we need to create fake adverse conditions. And we talked about this in nutrition, we talked about this initially, and you know, I, I just want to go quickly over uh, the first few episodes were about the gut biome. Super important, how we feed these, how we keep these diverse, uh, how many live in us, what their function is, and what they mean to us. They mean everything to us. Our immune system, heart, 
and brain health, our, you know, metabolism, you name it, it goes on, the list goes on, autoimmune diseases, the list goes on. Okay. Secondly, nutrition. We need to focus on nutrition. We need to eat better. But in that, there is something that whatever diet we decide fits us, that we can handle. We need to do one thing extra, and that is intermittent fasting. So no matter what diet you're on, you need to fast for, we talked about uh, 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of eating. And in that, not gorging, but eating good foods. This is also falls into the adverse conditions. We're creating a fake adverse conditions because we're not, the refrigerator is full, we're full, but we need to create this in our body. We need to have this time to let our cells restore and we need to activate certain genes for longevity. And this is what we're doing with the fasting. So we need to eat less often, not just fill to fill. And this is a lot of times what's happening right, in our daily lives. So when we, when we look at this and we look at the triggering of this survival, one of the things we also went through is, okay, once a year, twice a year, do a four day fast, long fast. And this is really to, you know, clean out the dead proteins. This happens after three days and it's, and it's critical to the body. We talked about this before. So <clears throat> moving on. What about exercise? Well, exercise is one, again one of these things because sedentary lifestyle will kill you. Exercise is probably the, the biggest lever you have in changing your epigenome and changing your chances for longevity, decreasing uh, your risk for heart disease, decreasing your risk for cardiovascular disease, decreasing your risk for dying from a fracture when you're older, keeping your strength. So we're, we'll, we'll talk about this. And we talked about moving, just getting to move, uh, exercise in general, getting, you know, getting your body so that you're sweating, so that you're breathing heavily, because fragility will kill you. And being sedentary is deadly. It's probably the deadliest thing you can do. And up to now, the best medicine we've seen for everything, type two diabetes, for heart disease, for is exercise. So let's talk a little bit about it because we've already talked, but I just want to repeat it because these are the bases that we have to have covered before we go on to the next, you know, the next levers. And the next levels are, are, are basically things we can do to optimize, but we have to have this base before we start optimizing. So when we stress the musculoskeletal system, we create hypoxia. Okay, this is when you run and you, you know, you go to the extra effort in, in, in exercise. When you do this, when you run out of breath completely, you turn on HIF-1 alpha. Now HIF-1 alpha causes uh, mitochondrial uh, hormesis, which means you start building more mitochondria in your cells. Now the mitochondria, in short, is what basically creates ATP, allows our body to produce ATP. ATP is the power we need, the fuel we need to run our bodies. So the more we have of those, the better. And this happens with hypoxia, short bursts of hypoxia, meaning, you know, the exercise. Continuous is, is never long, is never, never good. So when we, when we do this, we see that, you know, we can stop disease from happening. We can prevent 25% of cancers that happen. Cardiovascular disease, 30% reduction and all cause mortality, massive. Okay, this is big. When we get older, um, or if we have a terrible diet and we're, and we're sedentary, we get increased uh, glucose sensitivity due to X differentiation of cells. These cells just kind of get old, they lose their identity, and they're not producing gluc4 anymore. So to combat that, we need to exercise. Key, and some other things that we'll talk about. When we talk about 
the other benefits of exercise, ve uh, VEGF, made by the muscles after exercise, activates the PGC1. So what happens is this leaks out into the lining of the blood vessels, and then the blood vessels build more blood vessels so that you can have more circulation, more plasma, more blood flowing to your body and your brains. This is all good. This happens with the exercise. When we look at um, the epigenome, which is affected by exercise, the regulator of the DNA measures biological age. So we look at, okay, with our epigenome, if, as we know, 20% of what happens to us is genetic or what's predetermined is genetic. 80% we have a hand in. Okay, so I'm talking about this 80%, 80% of the lever that we need to move. So when we look at our biological age and we got different clocks, we got the Horvath clock, uh, which can show that you're either younger, the same age as your age or older. And it's a good measurement. We got the Prodeometer, um, measures protein in the blood, uh, GDF 15. And when we look at this in, in research, we're seeing as an example, uh, they did one on the Mediterranean diet, which showed a slowing of the aging process. So this is one of the reasons also that I do tend to move towards the Mediterranean diet. And, and as we know in the previous uh, programs that if you can do a, a, a fish vegetarian, uh, then that is what they're, according to where we're now with science, the best diet you can have. But you know, not all of us can do that. Um, I like steak, I like, you know, variety. I love my wine, I love my olive oil. So Mediterranean is more my fit. You really have to see what fits you, do it consistently, and then use the principles we teach because that's the thing, consistency is king. So you really have to, and we all have to kind of compromise somewhere in our diet. So you have to see what is the least compromise for you, which diet is the least compromise. So try different diets, see what fits you. And then, you know, do the intermittent fasting, do all the stuff we're talking about and exercise. So <clears throat> when we're looking at weight training, we're looking at resist the resistive exercise which is either for strength or for hypertrophy. Those two I like for aging because they, they trigger the most biomarkers. <clears throat> so what we're looking at here is as we age to maintain our muscle mass or to gain some muscle mass, because after 30, in your mid thirties, you start losing muscle mass, your hormones start dropping. Um, and if you reach 65 or older and you fall you break a hip guess what 50 percent chance of death after that the re the, the other 50 percent just lives horribly after after so really you have to you have to this is this is one of the big ones this is the the resistance training when you get older is the biggest lever you can pull remember that um, state from stabilizing your hormone levels to helping your posture as you age to maintaining muscle mass, um, it, it goes on and on. It you know, X differentiation cells shut down when you do resistance training. Um, you have fewer senescent cells, the better. These are bad for you, and it's all found in people that exercise. So <clears throat> when we look at, you know, the, the, and we talked about this before in the dieting, the four day fasting that I recommend also that's once or twice a year is really to trigger protein cleanup, the chaperone autophagy, and it's in episode three. Uh, this is part of the base. So once you have the base covered, and if you don't have it covered, go back to the previous episodes. So you can get those covered. Then let's look at what else you can do. Let's look at what else you can do to start optimizing. Well, I'm gonna start with the most unlikely, 
and the most expensive, which is hyperbaric oxygen treatment therapy. Now, I set up a hyperbaric oxygen treatment center in Santa Fe, New Mexico, long time ago, uh, 20 years ago, maybe. And I was really looking at, yeah, it's about 20 years ago or more, 22 years ago. And I was really looking at, okay, how can we help with um, diabetic ulcers? Um, how can we help with brain damage, with uh, people that had strokes? You name it, the list goes on and on. It's you know originally used for divers that get the bends. And that is when they ascend too quickly, they get bubbles in their blood, nitrogen bubbles, so they go into a hyperbaric chamber. And what the hyperbaric chamber does really is give you that pressure, pressurize you to that depth again, so 30 feet or more, uh, so one and a half times to so three times higher than normal atmosphere pressure, so that you know all the gases kind of contract, become very small, and then actually administer pure oxygen, so that the oxygen really can go deep into the tissue, deep into the cells to repair damaged cells. So that's, that's the key to hyperbaric treatment. It's all natural. Um, natural, I mean, you know, there's nothing added. It's just pure oxygen under pressure in your body. So you go into a chamber and they have personal chambers and you have big chambers. Now the personal chambers, you've got to really make sure that they're able to go to, you know, three bars to three times them higher than the atmosphere because you have a lot of these so-called personal chambers that say they can they are hyperbaric but they don't have the pressure and if they don't then it really doesn't work so that's one thing so what we've seen here is that uh, and the research was done by the group in Israel it's 2020 uh, Yaritza et al. And the conclusion was that the study indicates that HBOT, which is hyperbaric oxygen treatment, may induce significant senolytic effects, including significantly increases, increasing telomere length and clearance of senescent cells in the aging population. T cell cytotoxic and B cells were also noted to be up significantly. So this is great. This is showing us that, hey, hyperbaric medicine actually helps the aging process, helps you uh, stay younger. But we're talking, you know, 30 to 60 dives uh, and, you know, at a pretty good price. So is it, is it plausible for most of us? No. For, but there are people that have access to hyperbaric oxygen chambers and can do, you know, the 60 dives a year or whatever is needed. Hey, go for it. Go at it. It's an help. But again, this is not what's going to make it, make it happen. You need to have your bases covered. So you need to have, you know, your nutrition, your um, exercise needs to be on par. Uh, you know, your, your gut biome needs to be on par and also, you know, mental health. We'll talk about that in the next episode. So now we get to cold therapy. And the idea for cold therapy is that um, moving one of the one of the ideas is is to increase metabolism, um, also create a state of stress in your body, so you're able to cope mentally, physically better with stressful situations, everyday stress. And now all these therapies are um, short duration therapies, right? Anything that's long duration at extremes is bad for you. So we're talking about the body taking advantage of extreme bursts of therapies, which is in the food and, you know, with exercise. I mean, if we exercise and just kept exercising day and night, we would run our bodies to the ground. When a year without eating, we'd have, we'd be in trouble with our bodies. Okay. etc. So if, Inflammation, which is sometimes good for us, lasts long. They have chronic inflammation. Anything chronic is bad. 
So chronic inflammation will start eating your own tissue, okay, your own bones, and we have this with arthritis, which is a chronic inflammatory disease. So this is the thing. The body reacts on intervals of stress, and then it produces these benefits to us. So this is everything. With cold therapy, it's the same way. So we're doing cold submersion here. And we're doing it for a reason. Heart health, um, mental stability, mental health. We're doing it um, for uh, cardiovascular health, uh, especially going from white fat to beige fat to brown fat. This is the conversion that you get here. Um, and there's multiple benefits which we'll talk about. One of them also is stress mitigation. We talked about uh, stress mis mitigation in this. So it's extremely important. It's one of the things that is a hack that you can do. And you don't have to uh, have a beard and long hair whim <laughs> to do this. So anyone can do this. So let's enjoy. Let's make sure. Look, I got nothing on. So all just a real thin thing. We're going to go in. Protocol is 11 minutes a week. Uh, we're doing a couple minutes couple times a day uh, sorry a couple times a week so a couple times a day is crazy do it initially in your initial of your day um, never do it after a hard workout especially if you're doing hypertrophy training um, or strength training don't do it after uh, if you're doing cardio if you're doing any other training you can do it afterwards but with hypertrophy don't you need that you need the, the system to stay hot warm also what happens right now when I go in my actual core will warm up okay so it's kind of counterintuitive you get cold outside but inside your core warms up so that's why you don't want to do it before going to bed or late at night also because your whole system will wake up all right so help me enjoy this All right. Well, as you can see, we got ice and we're cold. Cold therapy, we're going to be looking at 11 minutes a week max. How you do that, you know, a couple times a week, three minutes each time, fine. Um, the cold, what you can handle. Don't go too much. Start slow. Go with the cold. Don't go and cause problems. Go with someone that knows what they're doing and, you know, get help with this. Get get coaching with this. Don't just, you know, go in because you could cause problems for yourself. And make sure with your physician, always make sure with your physician that you can do these things. You're good. Everything is good to go. When we look at uh, cold therapy, what we're doing here is you know, you have different fats in your body. And there's white fats, there's beige fats, there's brown fats. Well, the beige and brown fats are good fats. The white fat is just storage, doesn't do anything, is a bother, is what we're trying to get rid of. Now, in babies, as you know, babies don't move much. Babies have a lot of brown fat, so they can heat themselves. And the reason they can heat themselves is because brown fat has a lot of mit mitochondria. It's full of mitochondria, it's creating its own heat, it's very metabolic, okay, and it, eat, and it can and it can go through white uh, fat cells. So use them as fuel. So brown and beige are very good. But as we get older, we lose that, and the great white fat cells come in that we don't like. So what cold therapy can do is switch that up for us a little bit. It moves us in the right direction, okay. So. What we're seeing with, with these is that, how, how does this work? Well, it's extremely healthy because it burns the white fat, increases metabolism due to the PRDM16 gene, which is produced in the brown fat. This is what gets us the mitochondria. These UTPs uh, leak and produce heat with less free radicals. We can stimulate this with cold immersion and 
all the research that have been done is called immersion. So all the way to the neck, hands and feet inside um, the water and holding that for three minutes, four minutes, the shock that goes to the body. And what happens with that shock also is that we start getting used to that stimulation. So you got the adrenals going, you got everything going and your body gets used and it's the same kind of thing you go to when you're in massive stress. So in reproducing that, it slowly starts training you how to deal with stress in life. And this is one of the reasons like special forces and the military goes through this, you know, cold immersion training. So if we, we look a little further, we look, and we have to look also at our own rhythm, our own internal temperature, core temperature. So when we look at that, we look at our circadian rhythm and kind of the, the temperature that we hold as humans. So what, what we notice is that two hours before waking, we reach our lowest temperature, body temperature, okay? After we wake, our temperature starts going up and it goes up till late afternoon. At late afternoon, it starts coming back down to get us ready for sleep at night. Our temperature has to be pretty much down to get us back to sleep so we can sleep and it'll be at baseline. So we look at, okay, so, so this is the circadian rhythm. The other thing that we have to look at is, okay, how does our body regulate its internal temperature? Where does it get regulated? And from the outside, how we can influence that. And to, to look at that, it's very simple. Look at, you know, I'll give you an example. Okay, we're walking in the desert. It's hot, super hot. What happens to your body? First of all, you get lethargic. You start sweating. So you're, that's how your body releases heat. Okay. Um, you don't have much energy. You don't move much. You're pretty still. Uh, and, and you start spreading yourself out more because you need to kind of like let your body aerate, okay, to cool down. Now, if I were to give you cold towels at that point, small cold towels, I say, okay, put it on your body, let's get your temperature back. Your natural reaction would be put it on your head, put it on your neck, your back, wrong. The places where you actually can influence your temperature, um, the most is bottom of your cheeks, palms of your hands, and the bottom of your feet. And why is that? That is because that's where you have a glabrous skin. So where the arteries and veins come together and kind of switch, that's where you can dump heat. That's what lowers your core temperature. So <clears throat> when we're looking at, when we're looking at cold immersion, so just this is just to give you a little idea so what parameters we have to work with and what we need to kind of have in the back of our mind when we're doing the hot and cold stuff so <clears throat> when we look at what we're trying to do with the cold we're seeing that we're, we're improving mental performance we're able to regulate the mind under stress so we have an elevated mood and why do we have an elevated mood well there's a release there's like a 250 to 500% of release of epinephrine and dopamine. Okay, so these reduce inflammation, increase performance, give the feeling of happiness. And this is when we deliberately choose to go into cold therapy or cold immersion. And we have to deliberately do this because it has to be a, a conscious decision. We have to be prepared for it. We have to know what we're doing and go into it with the idea that these are the results we are trying to get. So when you go in, it'll vary what you can take at depending what time, what day. It depends on your circadian rhythm, where you get it. Um, so never go in after a meal. Um, there's a couple of rules. Don't go in after a meal. If you're doing strength training and you're doing hypertrophy training, wait four hours before you go to cold immersion. If you're doing endurance work, um, specific work for sports, technical work, if you're doing uh, even explosive work, uh, you can go on right away because it helps you recover quicker. So these are the things we have to, we have to look at. 
So, and, and so if we're focusing on metabolism, which is one of the things that we focus on here because we're trying to get more, um, produce more brown fat, this is what happens. When you're in the cold immersion, you have to shock your system every time. And so there's different ways to shock it. One, you know, work with the parameter, stay longer, decrease the temperature even more. And the other parameter is if you stay still, you create like a thermal layer around your body. So it, that kind of protects you a little bit. If you move around in the water, you'll get much colder. Um, so that's another thing you can play with. Move around in the water to get, you know, the temperature dropping even more. So the total, again, the parameters of this work would be 11 minutes per week. Uh, so, you know, three times a week, you've got the dopamine release we will elevate your mood, allowing you to focus and, and stay with this good feeling even after you did the dump. So a lot of, there's some research that has been done and about, you know, addicts that can do uh, cold immersion to kind of get the dopamine up and be able to stay off of drugs in that sense. So there's some work done in that sector. The human immunology response is amazing. Metabolic rate up 300%, plasma, norepinephrine up 500%, increased dopamine 250%, which persists afterwards. So it's a, it's, it just keeps on giving. We have, uh, with this stress, also less, we have no increase in cortisol. Okay, so that's the bad stressor. You don't want that. You want it when you're waking up, but you don't want that during the day. And you want to keep that down. This keeps it down. And it's better known as you stress. So, which has a positive health outcome. And uh, Hans Silier has uh, written a bunch of stuff on this. You can look that up. He has a bunch of studies on it. Um, <clears throat> and we're also looking at uh, Suzanne Soberg. Her studies on on this, which which show us, you know, what we need to do as far as also the protocol from going from hot to cold. Um, if you're gonna do that, it's not recommended to go hot cold, hot cold, hot cold. But if you do it, end always with cold. Don't end with hot. Um, and looking at you know looking at where the norepinephrine binds uh, to the white cells. What happens is release of UPC-1 and uh, Piper Gamma uh, increase the mitochondria downstream. So <clears throat> it acts like a fuel to burn the white fat. Overall core metabolism goes up. And one of the things that you also wanna, wanna include in your, in your session is that when you come out of the water, um, stay there, open up, shiver, okay? I want you to shiver. Because when you shiver, you have a succinate release. From the muscle which causes increase in metabolism the fat cells themselves get signals from norepinephrine and the neurons connected to the fat cells so this is this is extremely important for physical performance again after strength training or hypertrophy training avoid cold immersion for four hours okay so i think that's kind of gets us gets us into where we're looking at you know, using cold for. When we go to heat and sauna, it's an ancient therapy, just like, just like the cold has been. It's been known for in the Asian cultures uh, as a therapy used, Indian cultures, you name it, everywhere. With the Vikings, with the Norse people, they've all used cold and heat. And it's done amazing. I mean, it's always worked. And now we're, seeing, now we're having the science to back it up. So when we think of heat, we think of sauna. That's where most of the, uh, the work has been done. Uh, wet sauna, dry sauna. Now I know there's a lot of um, infrared out there, infrared saunas, infrared work. Um, my question is always, does it get to the right temperature that we need for it to work? So when we're looking at the temperatures, and we'll go over this a bit later in, in this, we have a protocol on, on what temperatures we like. So, you know, 
80 degrees Celsius or 176 Fahrenheit. That's the starting range. It's between that and 100 Celsius, and two, which is 200 Fahrenheit. So in between 80 and 100 Celsius, 176 Fahrenheit and 200 Fahrenheit. That's where you want it. And we want this about 57 minutes a week. So, you know, in between 10 or 20 minutes, right in there, you're a good, a good session. So we're seeing that heat, we're going to use more than cold. Because cold, we're recommending your 11 minutes a week. You know, as comparative to this, we're, we're saying, okay, use this much more. So when we look at heat, immediately, we're, we're looking at um, reducing the risk of stroke, cardiovascular disease, and improving overall longevity. So stroke and cardiovascular disease for most people is like a big, you know, a big red flag, um, a big scare. So this is one that can actually guarantee to reduce. But what, I, you know, again, your nutrition and your exercise, especially your exercise, are the big levers. This is, a, this is an extra lever that we're doing here. So you gotta have that other stuff right. Um, if you're breastfeeding or you're pregnant, stay out. If you got any health issues, contact your doc, a doctor and make sure that, you know, you don't get into hyperthermia and do damage to the neurons because that's permanent. So you don't want to do that. You want to really look, um, get some guidance on this, start off slow, start off with low heat and then move your way up. Your body will adapt. So how does, how does our body detect changes in heat? Well, the skin neurons that sense changes in the heat send a signal to the spinal cord in the dorsal horn, to the lateral parabrachial area, to the pre-optic area, and that's above the mouth, kind of the roof of the mouth. So when this temperature changes, also behavioral changes, you'll we'll also see behavioral changes when everything heats up. You want to get out of the heat. I mean, this is like a a reaction almost that you get. So it impacts the way we think and the way we feel. Endothelial cells, uh, you know, actually change, okay? Blood vessels dilate, increasing the surface area. You also start sweating. Acetylcholine is involved here. You feel lethargic on the hot day. You spread out, the muscles go into vasodilation and the sweat, sweating dump. So this is what heat does to the body. And it's, and it's a lot of times happens automatically. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to know what to do. Our body just makes us do this. And this is again, deliberate heat exposure. So again, when we look at this, if we wanna look at more of the studies to reduce mortality, um, stroke and heart disease, look at the BMC medicine studies uh, where you can find this. And again, the studies that were, testing, were tested were between 80 Celsius and 100 Celsius, 176 Fahrenheit and 200 Fahrenheit. Again, between 10, 20 minutes, total of 57 minutes in a week. So when we look um, at a 50% decrease in, in cardio events uh, or stroke um, and an all-cause mortality that is greatly improved, this, you know, is a, a, uh, a very valuable tool. And it's a tool that's not expensive that we could do. Now, there's ways to do it with these sweatsuits and stuff. I don't recommend it because it's not very stable. It's not very, you know, try to get into a sauna. Most gyms have them. Uh, make sure you can control the temperature, um, measure the temperature, see, you know, what you can hold in there. And again, with your circadian rhythm, some days you can go longer, some days you gotta go shorter. Feel it, okay? Also what this does with the heat is you optimize the gro growth hormone me mechanism. So it gets activated. So you release more growth hormone in the body, which is really good. Uh, reduction of cortisol, increased volume plasma with the, you know, with uh, strokes. Uh, the heartbeat gets increased, um, vascular changes. It basically mimics like um, cardio exercise. So it's a real good thing. But what we've seen with the studies 
and there's a study released in 2021 and the current release uh, and we're seeing that with with gh release really it's in the shock um, that we see the spike in gh so if we start doing it too much if we do this three to four times a week we'll see less and less uh, trigger of gh being released so if you're doing it for gh release um, once a week to once every 10 days so the shock stays there if you're doing it for metabolism increase then three four times a week make sure you hit that 57 or an hour a week um, and I you know I like to talk about another you know part of this which is the HSP uh, the heat shock protein activation with changes at the molecular level short term it's a good thing what it does is um, it travels to the brain and body to prevent protein misfolding okay so this this is key to longevity the health protection is possibly dna repair pathway it's the fox o3 which regulates clearing of uh, senescent cells there's no specific protocol for activation really we're seeing repair at the protein level we're seeing senescent cells being cleared out this is all moving us to longevity so these are very important facts that happen here um, with the heat therapy so again get your basis right and then you can use these three to really kind of optimize uh, your health your longevity please subscribe ring the bell notification our next episode is going to be super sexy it's going to be mental well-being so be sure to stay tuned. Thank you.